This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FI Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we have a distinguished guest, Ambassador Serna. He's an author, columnist, diplomat, and former Indian ambassador to the United States. He also served previously as the High Commissioner of India to the United Kingdom and the ambassador to Israel. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for coming to our show. We appreciated you taking the time to talk to us. I finally remember when we met uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. a couple of times. So thank you very much for your service to India and to our nation, what you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, happy to be here with you. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, you had a very distinguished career as an Indian ambassador to many countries, including to the United States. How do you look back on your 36 years of career in the Indian Foreign Service? What skills and abilities have you learned from your experience? And do you believe that Foreign Service is not a career, it's a lifestyle? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. And it's actually ended up at 38 years, not just 36. Wonderful. So by the much. time I finished with it, it's, uh, it's been a lifetime uh, of, of being in the Indian Foreign Service. I think, first of all, it's been a great privilege. It's been a tremendous privilege to be part of this uh, uh, service, which uh, serves the nation in some very, very important uh, ways, which are not always obvious uh, uh, to everybody. Uh, so it's been an honor to represent India. Uh, and I look back on it as a very, very rich experience. The, the career, the service gave me an opportunity uh, to be part of uh, uh, India's uh, development in a way, uh, India's growth. Uh, because, you know, when I joined in 1980 and when I ended in 2018, uh, the place of India and the world had changed completely like from yeah. night to day. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it gave me a ringside seat on seeing how we were changing, how we were perceived, how our bilateral relations with important countries were changing, how India's importance was growing, both in bi the bilateral context and the multilateral context. And I must say that I was very fortunate uh, that I had a very wide variety of postings I, I served in, in, in the Soviet Union to begin with. Oh. I served in uh, communist Poland. I served oh. in small and very important countries like Bhutan. Uh, I served in the Middle East, in Iran and Israel. Wow. And I served uh, in multilateral situations in, in Geneva and did a lot of work in New York and right. then ended up in uh, London and Washington. So, you know, I really did, was very fortunate to get a very, very wide view uh, of, of, of India's foreign policy. So I think I have a lot to, to thank the service for. Well, I uh, thank you for your service uh, as well. So it goes both ways, Mr. Ambassador. You know, your last assignment, uh, if I remember uh, well, you were in Indian ambassador to the United States in 2018. What are the highlights of your two year distinct base in Washington, D.C.? I remember very well and, and that you were very instrumental in engaging the politicians from both sides of the aisles, Democrats and Republicans. And also, you were also very instrumental in deepening, strengthening and broadening the U.S.-India relationship. So can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, whenever there is a transition in the government, it's a very important point. Uh, and, and I was there, uh, I reached Washington just uh, 72 hours before President Trump's uh, election results were announced. So it was really in half very, uh, a very different sort of unusual transition, as, as you would agree, uh, being a Washingtonian. It was not just a normal, it was not just a normal Republican administration coming in but uh, a President Trump's administration, which was quite unpredictable in many ways. It had many new faces. So I think the first challenge was to get to, get to know the, the key players, to get, to, get, uh, to get them to know the India story. 
so that you know we have a break in the upward growth of india us relations that we have been seeing for 20 years so that was the first challenge and i think a, a tremendous high point was frankly when when uh, prime minister modi had his first meeting with president trump in june right. 2017 right. and it was a uh, from what i remember even if i say so myself it was a very successful visit when the president and prime minister got off to a great start in in their mm -hmm. interactions and then we had several other uh, high points during uh, that tenure we we you know we we fleshed out the major defense partner status mm -hmm. between india and the united states right we got the uh, technology access through the sta1 right uh, and 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 you know we we signed several important agreements particularly on the defense and security side and there was a lot of cooperation on terrorism and and other such strategic uh, areas and you've seen that you know the pecom changed to mm -hmm. indo pecom uh, right. at that time and the indo-pacific vision has come into being which which has a special role for india in, in cooperation with the united states so it was a very interesting period it was a crucial period uh, and and i'm glad that uh, you know we could manage what we did Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Ambassador. I wanted to change the, uh, our gears and talk a little bit about your thoughts on the nomination of the Kamala Harris as a Democratic Vice President nominee. Do you believe her nomination is a reflection of the importance and influence of the Indian American community? An Indian American set to wield greater influence in US politics. As you know, she identifies herself as a black Americans because of her roots uh, as African American. But she fondly talks about her mother's uh, roots, which is in India. And there has been a lot of enthusiasm in the American community of her nomination. Do you believe that we can redeem the America's promise of which is the democracy, our values, our character, our conscience, and diversity? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, we have to, first of all, the Indian American community has grown in political importance over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, they're almost four million strong. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, while they were always good professionals and very highly regarded engineers, IT specialists, mm -hmm. doctors, and, and so on, uh, right. I think in recent years, we have seen their coming into the political field. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they used to have one person in the Congress uh, four years ago, and, and now we have four people. And you have right. the first senator, who's Senator Kamala Harris. Uh, so I, there is no doubt that in, in the, on the national stage, in the local stage, state level, uh, the Indian American community has become more politically active. It's an important community. Uh, for the United States. It's a community that pays its t taxes. It's a community that, that uh, you know, is highly regarded in, in many ways. It's so in some ways, yes, of course, uh, you know, Kamala Harris being of Indian descent, the Indian American community can uh, rightly be proud uh, of her being where she is. Uh, at the same time, I would only strike a note of caution. And the note of caution is that, as you rightly said, she does identify herself as, as a black American. She's grown up as a black American proud woman. Uh, she's grown up uh, as a member of the black church. She's grown up as a member of the black choir and, and the black sororities. So, mm -hmm. and, and well it said. is all right. It is all right because, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite rightly, probably the reason why she has been chosen for the run to be the running mate uh, of candidate Biden is that they can reach out to the ethnic communities, to ethnic America, right. which feels threatened perhaps by white supremacists. And this includes right. black right. America, this includes minority communities, ethnic communities like the Indian American community. The only thing is uh, we must be enthusiastic, we must be supportive, but we must not be over enthusiastic. Because well uh, we must remember that she is the vice, she would be, if she wins the ticket, she would be the vice president of the United States 
and she would have a commitment to the issues of United States. So we should not believe that, oh, she's Indian and she's saying this and she's doing that. So let's, let's not set ourselves up for undue disappointment. Very well said. I wanted to uh, ask you a question. As you know, India has a few diplomats compared to its size. Are you concerned that the best and brightest are not joining the Indian Foreign Service? And what will be your message to the young generation who wants to follow in your footsteps and want to participate as an ambassador, maybe one day, in the Indian Foreign Service? Well, uh, you know, I would not agree that the best and brightest are not joining the okay. Indian Foreign Service. Uh, because uh, the only thing is that, you know, 40 years ago when we joined the Foreign Service, there were very few careers. Uh, right. available to um, uh, bright people in India. And, and uh, today there are many careers available. Right. But what I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by the younger generations. They are, they are very, uh, very different from us in many ways. They are very, you know, they are, they are on the go. They are technologically savvy. They are very, you know, they don't have any baggage in, in many right. ways. Very and well. they are uh, the response that New India uh, uh, needs. So I, am, I have full faith. You're absolutely right. We are a very small service. Although in recent years, there have been efforts to expand our service. You know, when we used to have about 600 odd diplomats, today we have about 900 odd diplomats, which is, which is a change. It will take us some time to expand. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, I, I would like to believe that we make up in quality what we might lack in quantity. <laughs> That's a very well said. I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, because you were, you were ambassador to Israel, how important is Israel to India? As you know, Israel has very powerful lobbying in the United States. Can be there any alignment of interest between India and Israel lobbying effort in DC? As I understand, that India is the largest buyer of Israel military equipment. What are the things that India can learn and the Israels can learn in terms of technology, water conservations, and agriculture? Well, you know, the, the India-Israel relationship, I was very fortunate to, uh, to be in the chair for four years as ambassador in, in Israel. And I think it has been one of the most crucial strategic uh, relationships that India has developed in the last uh, uh, 30 years after we established, uh, 25 years after we established our uh, diplomatic relations with, with Israel, it's not only military and security. Uh, there is a commonality of views. There's a de strong democratic element. There is a, there is a, a lot of uh, 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 cooperation in areas like agriculture, mm -hmm. in in water, in water, uh, in in IT, in telecom, uh, and and you know the and counterterrorism. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, for yeah. for uh, yes, and so for for Israel, India is a very important partner also in terms of being a huge market that is available to it, and and I think. The fact that the India-Israel relationship has prospered helps the India-US relationship. At the same time, if the India-US relationship goes well, uh, it adds a lot of comfort to India-Israel relationship. So there is this triangulation of interests. And, and you're quite right. Uh, we have been uh, in close touch uh, with the major Jewish uh, uh, American Jewish uh, associations like and you know IPAC and uh, right. Right. American Jewish uh, Committee etc. And we we've always been in touch with them for the last ten or twelve uh, fifteen years. And I think there is a certain alignment in interests. Uh, it's it's a lot of comparing of notes, a lot of assistance where required. Uh, there's a lot of empathy between the two you know the two countries when working in the United States. And I think that that is something which will strengthen as we go along and needs to strengthen. I wanted to ask you a question. You're, you're, you're a prolific author, you're a writer, you're a translator. Please tell us about your literary interests and how did you find time during your diplomatic years to write so many books? You have written books such as The Exile, uh, the book of uh, Nanak, 
we were not lovers, second thought. And one, one book that uh, intrigued my interest was Zafar Nama. <laughs> uh, how do you find time yes. to do all these things? And it's a wonderful thing to do what you're doing. So tell us about uh, a little bit of your interest. Well, that's, you know, I was writing before I became a diplomat. And uh, it was something which I've been, want, uh, you know, passionate about doing ever since uh, I can remember. So I think I, I just simply had to find the time. It's not always been easy uh, of running almost two parallel uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, vocations. Uh, <laughs> let me call it that. In, 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 you know, and so, uh, yes, the writing has been in uh, fits and starts. But there have been times when I've been able to get more time uh, or there have been times at the cost of something else I managed to do. So yes, uh, there's been a variety of books over the years and frankly, my diplomatic career has actually helped me because uh, you know, I've been able to be present in different cultures, be, be experience different uh, landscapes uh, and that certainly has added to, to my literary growth. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Zafar Nama. That was a particular yeah. effort which I made uh, uh, on the weekends when I was posted in, in Israel and we used to have the wow. Shabbat uh, in Israel. Yes. So, you know, not even the telephone rang uh, from Friday right. afternoon till Saturday night. Right. So I could sit and spend some time uh, on my literary work. That's a wonderful. Uh, as I have been fascinated that you have written a lot about Sikh Gurus and his travels and teachings. What motivated you to acquire an interest in their lives and teaching? Do you believe the Sikh faith is rooted in Guru Nanak's teaching? If so, what are the teaching and spiritual spirituality that all of us need to embrace, not only in India, but around the world? Well, I think these are you know, uh, teachings. If you if you listen to him and uh, and his uh, teachings and his writings, uh, which are included in the Sikh uh, holy book, the Guru Granth Sahib, uh, they these are very extremely universal. You know, they they are not uh, uh, they are extremely universal in the sense of appealing to all human beings, talking of the beauty of creation, talking of the uh, the near of the creator, uh, the, the, the supreme creator who is uh, without a form, without a name, um, you know, without fear, without beginning, without end. And in that sense, uh, you know, and, and how a human being should interact uh, in terms of thinking about the creator and think singing his praise. So they are very universal teachings. They talk of the oneness of God. They talk of the equality of, uh, of uh, human beings. Uh, they talk of the positive position of, of uh, men in society. Uh, they talk of the beauty of nature. Uh, uh, they, they, they talk of uh, the end to discrimination. They talk of uh, a humanistic love and, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, a brotherhood uh, of man. So I think these are teachings which are timeless and they are universal. So I, I did try to do the book of Nanak, which was a, very, a kind of introduction uh, to his life, travels and teachings. He was an extremely well-traveled man who went in all four directions. And uh, essentially to uh, show, uh, you know, to debate with practice of religion, to show that whatever religion you follow, uh, understand its real merit its real meaning, not only its rituals. And, and therefore, you know, so that, that was the, the so I, I had an opportunity to write that book. It was a very, very humbling uh, experience. And of course, the Zafar Nama we have already mentioned, which was a uh, translation I did of a, a 111 verse, Persian verse, a letter written by Guru Singh to Emperor Aurangzeb, oh, okay. uh, talking of the uh, moral and spiritual bankruptcy of uh, of the empire at that stage. Uh, so it you know so that itself shows that also is very relevant because it's what governance is should be 
the values that governance should espouse, uh, the the belief in spirituality that a governor should have. So we all of us need to proudly and truly embrace the teachings of the Guru Nanak. And, and, and that's something that you are propagating and promoting to the wider audience. And thank you for doing so. Um, um, I'm very uh, impressed by his teachings and his followings. And thank you for all you're doing it. I want to, uh, before I change uh, uh, the gears and, and also close our conversations, I want to talk about, can you give us uh, some predictions of the coming U.S. elections, considering the fact that there's only few battleground states, uh, Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, and to some extent Ohio uh, as well, that will, that will have the impact on the U.S. elections, and that will, which we need, uh, the Democrats need 270 electoral votes, and so is the, so is the Republican needs it, but uh, what's your thoughts are? What are we headed? What are we doing? What do we need to do? Well, I think, uh, Frank, you are sitting in Washington, D.C. You probably have a better feel of the pulse well, I'm uh, working of what is happening in the United States. Yes. Yes. So I think, but as, as, as an observer sitting far away, I can only rely on what we read in the newspapers. Uh, but I think uh, at the moment, the, the, at the moment, the, um, the uh, campaigns are, uh, you know, in favor of Biden. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we still have the presidential debates to come. You're right. Uh, so, you know, that could, that could be a crucial thing. It's a, going to be a thin margin. I'm more worried about the fact that uh, uh, it should not be a, a violent election. It should not be a contested election. Correct. Uh, Very well. And I, I, you know, because uh, it should not lead to a lot of litigation because uh, I think the world needs the United States leadership uh, to be in uh, control, to be in place, to be in control of its economy, the pandemic, and, and other things. And, you know, it's a little disturbing to see that the United States is, is suffering so much uh, from racial divide uh, once again. So there, these are the things that are marking this election. So hopefully, I mean, from what one sees in the polls, at least the national level polls, uh, Joe Biden is leading uh, by seven, eight points. Mm -hmm. And uh, although the state uh, polls are beginning to tighten up. Right. So I think a couple of debates on will be, you know, we'll get a clearer view. Of course, there's a controversy every day. So that changes things. Today, you have <laughs> Bob Woodward's book is the, right. is the news and the controversy. Yeah, that's not a so, very favorable. You know, uh, all this, yes. So we we'll will see. Well, exactly. And I don't want to be, um, I want to be, cautiously optimistic but the fact of the matter is that i worked for harry clinton in the campaigns and uh, everybody predicting that she will win by the not 270 but 322 electoral votes and then it didn't happen and she lost it by 350,000 votes uh in wisconsin florida not wisconsin wisconsin michigan and i believe pennsylvania and ohio combined so you're right we just have to wait and see what happens and uh, and, and this is the time for the United States to provide the leadership as we are a beacon of hope for democracy, diversity around the world, around the globe. And we need to provide to make sure we have a global leadership. And thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for all you have done and uh, for India and for the world. And thank you very much for coming to our show. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week and thank you for watching.